good to see you. I'm always honored to come and uh, be able to be up here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Fick. I, uh, my life got changed here at this church, um, actually in the other building. And, uh, and so, and I got to see this be built, be part of all that. And uh, uh, since then, I've been in Carlsbad and in Orange County. And then in 2016, I became the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel Carlsbad in North San Diego. So um, it's, good to, it's good to be back, though. I always love uh, coming back here because this place is near and dear to my heart. And I love Pastor Ed and Pastor Greg and Pastor Jason and Pastor Jeff, the whole crew, the whole crew, all of them. Okay, so there you go. I said all my nice things. Um, well, we're uh, going to be looking uh, this evening at uh, starting in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And you're thinking, wow, that's an interesting book. You guys know that's the most quoted book by Jesus, Deuteronomy. Isn't that interesting? Um, but we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, in a message titled, What About the Next Generation? You guys know this past Sunday was what? It was Mother's Day. Yeah. And uh, I, I really was, I was studying for Mother's Day. I wanted to do a special text uh, for the moms um, at, at our church. And, and this really inspired me. And it's, it's, it's not just for the moms at all. It actually became much more broad than that. But it addressed the real issues going on in our world right now, which is what about the next generation, right? Because in, in these rooms here, is, these are the next generation, right? the children's ministry, the, the middle school, junior high ministry, the high school ministry, the college groups that meet. What about the next generation? So I was, I was looking in, uh, in ways to inspire these moms that give their all and, and are exhausted and, and at most nights go to bed thinking, did I blow it? Am I like doing well? Like what is going, you know, you feel so tired and exhausted. And so I want to encourage them. And I also wanted to give some kind of like light scriptural path to what does it look like to raise the next generation? And, and it's much broader than being a parent. We all have a part in this, uh, both for ourselves and for those around us. And so hopefully tonight, we'll all be encouraged to, to go out and leave this place uh, to, to make an impact and be part of what's going on in the next generation. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Would you guys stand up and we could read? Would that be cool? You don't have to. I, already say, I say that as you've already done it. Um, let's read verses 1 through 9, then we'll pray. Now this is the commandment. These are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Oh. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your head, and they shall be on the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts, um, of your house and on your gates. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, tonight that we get to gather together and, and, and take a look at your word. And God, we pray that we would just uh, be receptive, Lord, to what you want us to see and hear this evening. So God, we pray that you would uh, just yeah, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, that we would just be refreshed, um, encouraged, and that we would make a real-life impact on the next generation um, before us. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys may be seated. How many in here have our parents? How, you know, oh, that's a lot, a lot of you. God bless you, right? You guys know 
Kids are like the greatest joy and the most work. I have three, um, and that we're in the mix. Like it's 10, 9, and 5, you know, so we've been in the mix for a while. And it's like I, I can't think of anything that brings more joy uh, or more, I mean, there's just so much to it right? You're responsible for feeding them, for teaching them, for raising decent people and members in society. All the time seeing shortcomings that are like, look way too much like you. You know, you see all of your flaws and faults and you're just looking at them and you're like, ah, why don't you do the things that I don't do and I want you to do better than me, you know, basically, right? And so we see that in them. And, uh, but as believers, we want to see so much more. And so when we're looking at this, we're looking at what it looks like to raise Christ following, a Christ following generation. It's not just contributing members to society, but like makes it an impact on the world around us. We're going to see um, in this, this text in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses recording the word of God. And he's reminding them uh, they've spent their time in Egypt, right? And Moses says, has, God has led them out. They've been wandering around in the wilderness, and these are the things that he wants this next generation to remember as they're entering into the promised land. So, again, verse 1. Now, in the, now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Remember and observe what you've been taught. Remember. Remember everything that God has shown you. Remember everything that God has, has given you, right? Right? Uh, at Mount Sinai, they were given the law, right? And they, that was a reminder that these are the things that they're to remember, to observe. Uh, uh, observing means that you do them, right? James talks about that. And like, we don't want to just be hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. So it's remember and then do them. Like, let these things become uh, things that you do, that come out of your life, right? Not just something you talk about, but something you do. Fear the Lord and keep his statutes, uh, I remember when I first got saved, I struggled with the idea of fearing the Lord, right? Because I loved just like feeling like, man, God is so close. Jesus is so close. But the idea of fearing the Lord, it's, it's this uh, awe, this, this astonishment of who God is. Like it's, it's marveling at how big he is. And you don't have to look any further. You look at the Gospels. And every time Jesus seems to have an encounter with a Pharisee or a big group of people, you'll see it again and again and again. They, they, people leave astonished or in awe or they marvel at his wisdom. It's just there's this awe and reverence. Everything that God does, it leaves awe. Even his angels, the angels will show up and you never see like people playing it cool when an angel shows up, right? When an angel shows up, everyone's freaked out. I don't know what they look like, but I know they're, like, terrifying looking. They're not like the precious moments that are, like, you know, sitting on your shelf. Although that would be freaky, too, if one of those came to life, you know. Be like, yeah, I think I'd be scared of that also, you know, but a different kind of scared. And then you just hammer, ah, you know, anyway. So remember and observe the things you've been taught. Fear the Lord. Keep his statutes. Right? A reverence before the Lord. That, that reverence is a, a sign that you believe God is who he says he is. A lack of fear means we don't believe God is big and powerful. And if we don't believe that God is big and powerful, it will manifest itself in the way we live our life and how much we observe the things he says. Right? Because we go, if we don't think God's big and powerful, we're going to think something else is bigger and powerful, whether it's us, our, ourselves, or the world, or, you know, the system, the powers that be, the government, whatever. So we keep this fear for the Lord. It's like a reverence thing, and it's also an empowerment thing when we're looking at, like, God, you're so big, you're so powerful, that what else, what do I need to worry about? Right? Romans 8, 31, if God's for us, who could be against us? You plus God, mm, that's a winning combo. 
And in case you forgot, look throughout the Bible, remember and observe the things God's already done. Right? This is the God who part the Red Sea, part of the Red Sea, right? Right? He's the God that took a young kid and destroyed a bit, you know, took out a nine foot giant with a sling. That, that, that closes the mouth of lions so that Daniel could sleep right next to him. That, that didn't even, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not even smell like fire when they came out, or smoke when they came out of that, that uh, fiery furnace. See, God wants us to remember how big and powerful he is. That's like the fear of the Lord. Awe, reverence, marveling. Right? So, yeah, here we go. And what's the promise? It's inner and outer blessing. Prolong days, and it'll be well with you and multiply. You're going to have prolonged days. This is, this is like you, you will be blessed in everything you do, and, and you will be well. You'll feel like not like physically, like this is not a, you know, prosperity gospel or, you know, that God's going to heal everything, you know. But you will be well. It's like the kind of the idea of like, you know, be anxious for nothing and all things prayer. Let the peace of God rule your heart, you know? That, that's, that's the well with you idea. And multiply. I, I think there's multiplication as far as having kids. I think it's also multiplication as far as believers following Jesus. Hear, O Israel, verse 4. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Here. You want to know how to pass this on, because this is talking about how you pass this on to the next generation. It starts with the first generation loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is how we model passing it on. It starts with us. The most confusing thing, and one of the, the, the most, uh, something we've got to be honest about is the more hypocritical we are, the more we say one thing, we say we have values, but our lives don't match up with those values, the more we discredit our awe and our fear and our reverence and our belief in God. It starts with us. So it's like, I want my kids to experience, I want them to do it better than I did it. Great. Well, then you do it now. You start, it starts with us now, right? Right? We start with, in front of them, before them, in honesty and transparency, with openness, loving the Lord your God with all of your heart. This means passionately. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Passion and zeal. This, this is what makes an effective leader, right? We don't manipulate people with emotions, but you should have emotions for your love for God. It should manifest itself in passion. It should be like almost overwhelming at times. So we passionately love the Lord with all our soul. That would be all that we are. With everything that we have. Right? Our inner and, you know, it's like all of me. You get all of me. And with all of your strength, that means we put effort into it. You know, far too often it's, it's like kind of like, we give God our last little bit, you know? If it works out, if I have time, it's like, man, give him your best. Because if you think about investing, is there a better investment than an internal investment? I mean, this is the best investment you can make, right? I mean, Jesus warned us of this, right? Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where there's moth and there's rust and thieves. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. So we, we love God and we do this in front of the next generation. I'm telling you, this is a plan. This one works, okay? And it, because it's important, we got to understand you can't take someone somewhere you don't go yourself. And it's so easy to want to be like, take, like, you go, you go further than me. It's like, man, no, we've got to take ownership. The best thing is, is, is that it's, you don't have to be perfect. The idea is that you follow him. It's kind of like Paul. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. That means you're bringing him with you in everything you do. More about that here in a second. Right? 
Remember, uh, yeah, good friend used to always say, rules without relationship breeds rebellion. The idea is that if you don't have a relationship and, and you're just trying to set up rules, it's like there's nothing to follow. You know? Okay, moving on. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. In your heart means we meditate on the word. It springs up from our heart, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So these words we dwell in. It's like it's deep. It's, it's rich. It just comes out of you, right? Again, this speaks of real, actual relationships. Quiet time. Uh, reading, praying, like knowing him. Just like Jesus, right? Jesus, I love this. Jesus modeled this perfectly, right? How did Jesus come? He shows up and he says, guys, this is how you do it. I, I already wrote it down. Just do it. No, what did Jesus do? His disciples look for him. Where in the world is he? He's up on the mountain praying. Yeah, what are you doing? There's people waiting to see you. Jesus, we're getting a following. He's like, leave me alone. This is more important. I've got to get up there and get with my father. Be with my father. And the disciples had this, this perfect uh, bird's eye view or, you know, where they get to follow him and see everything that he does. And, and what a Christian literally means a Christ follower. Like we follow Christ. That's the whole model of discipleship. So how that gets passed down is as we're following Christ, then we bring others along with us to follow Christ with us. So what does this look like, right? Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Diligently means repeatedly. That's what that means, diligently. So you repeatedly bring it up. You know, the important things. We just got um, done. My son's regular baseball season just ended. We're sad, man. I love baseball. And I'd sit there in the car every single, right before every game, I said, tell me what you're thinking when you're about to hit the ball. Tell me, what is your process? And he says, I'm thinking, and we have all this like little pneumatic kind of, you know, things. And he's like, okay, I'm sitting there and I'm ready. And he's like, I load. And we talk about, take the knob, stab the catcher, stab the pitcher. It sounds terrible, but this is like, you know, um, stab it, stab it. And then as you're coming through, throw your hands. And he's like, okay, yeah. We have to do that because it, we need repetition. I said, when you're pitching, what, is, what are you doing? Because it's all about these mechanics. They're going to pay off in the long run. And you're going to know when you're throwing wild, this is what happened. Cool thing is he ended up making the all-star team this year. So we, we move on. But it's, it's, it's all about the same repetition. We know this, right? So diligently, repeatedly teach these things to your children, Right? How do your children learn? You make them sit there and you just line it out for them, right? No, you do it like Jesus did it. So what does that look like? You should talk to them. I, I love this. I think this is so casual, so organic, and so often, okay? You should talk to them, uh, uh, talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. This means there's just an ongoing conversation. This is Jesus. Jesus, why are you doing this? What's, what, what's up with that? What, what is that? Like, Lord, I don't think this is a good idea. Oh, I get it now. Okay. And what were his disciples doing for three years following Jesus around, watching everything he did, becoming part of it? He brought them in. He encouraged them. You guys know, leaders, good leaders don't make followers. Good leaders make more leaders. That's the idea of discipleship. Like, you raise them up and you give them opportunities. This is what the next generation needs. But I think we've ran into a lot of problems because we're like, well, you know, do as I say, not as I do. And that's just not going to work anymore. It does not fly. Because it used to be you could say whatever you wanted to and no one would even know because they'd probably try and look it up on an encyclopedia that's like 40 years old and it's not even sure, you know, like back in the day. How do you deal with a wound? Well, you know, you leave it wide open and let the sun do, you know, pour a little bit of dirt on it or whatever. You're like, no, this is not what we, you know. 
bad information. Now, kids can just literally look up Google, whatever you say, they'll find out if you're real or you're not real. They're going to know, right? And especially kids, they know everything going on. They know the way you are, the way you think, the way everything, all of that stuff. So what we do is not, again, we're not trying to be perfect in front of them, but we bring them in even on the struggle. I remember on Saturday night, before I gave a similar message on Sunday morning, I just, I was tired. We'd had the uh, game that morning. It just had been like a long week, and I was just shot. And we were trying to do homework, and they were not doing it. Oh, and I'm like, just just do it. And I'm like, I'm like trying to like, I'm basically giving them all the answers so we could just get it done with. And I'm like, just give me your paper. I will type this. It will be done in a couple minutes and we can go back to normal life. And I'm losing my temper and I'm just so frustrated and everybody knows it. And it's Saturday night, right before Sunday morning. And then dad's going to be up there and he's going to be like, isn't it so great? You know? And I remember I was just like, I just had to tell him, hey, guys, um, I'm so sorry. I'm acting like a jerk. But you guys are too. And so we need to work on this together. You know, we, I didn't really go that far. But I said, but I was, I was honest with him. I'm like, guys, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I am tired. That's not an excuse. But I'm not, I'm not doing this right. So you guys forgive me. I'm, I'm losing my temper way too easily with you guys right now. And they're, they're always, always like, oh, yeah, for sure. But there's something about asking for grace. There's something about asking for forgiveness. It's something about telling your kids, I blew it. <laughs> and I did not make it today. Today was not my best day. But that's bringing them in on the conversation. Guys, I need God's grace today. Look, I mean, I didn't even, I did not even get a chance to really pray this morning. That game was too early. We got up and went. We had youth group last night. It was just like, and man, that affects me. Guys, bring them in on it. Talk about it. When you sit, talk. When you walk, talk with them. It's like an ongoing conversation. When you go to sleep, you're talking about it. When you wake up, you're talking about it. You guys see it? This is how you pass it to the next generation. That's why he's like, I don't know why my kids went away. I brought them to church. You're like, yeah, but they, they need the real thing and they want it. You know? Maybe my son had said, Dad, I don't understand some of this stuff. Can you, like, explain it to me? I'm like, no, just let somebody else explain it. No, that's like discipleship. That's amazing. Like, can you help me through this? Yes. Of course, you know, if you're not a parent, this is, this is not just for parents. But the idea is the next generation, they just need people to walk alongside them. When I, when I became, when I first came around, there was a couple of guys that really, really poured into me here, big time, like really poured into me. And they saw me at my worst, and they saw me at my best, and they had grace, and they always let me in on the struggles and the messes and all this and that in their own life. And I just, I just trusted them, and I'm just so grateful for mentors and friends like that. Because it wasn't like some weird thing where it's like, oh, I'll never measure up to that. Because I would look at them and go, oh, they are not perfect. But like they love God and they, their life really is about seeking and following and honoring God. And I know when trouble comes, that's where you go. These are friends like that. These are people like that. And they invest and it makes all the difference in the world. And the cool thing is when you disciple someone well, then they disciple other people well. Like, it's like you're training them, and they're tra- it's like you're starting off. The way the world is, it's the, that way, but the opposite, <laughs> you know? And this is exactly what the disciples experienced. When they were sitting with Jesus, he'd be talking. He'd be like, you know, the kingdom of God's kind of like this, you know? And they'd be walking. He's like, guys, take a look over there. See that tree? You know, I love it. They're sleeping. They're waking up. He's always, everything's a teachable moment. We were at a, some friend's house in Maine, and, and uh, our friend um, was getting married, and, and my wife was in the wedding. And um, it was actually Ken Graves. You guys remember Pastor Ken Graves? Anybody know? It's like a, just a lumberjack, grizzly, crazy man, you know? And I got there. We'd been, we flew a red eye because it was cheaper, and then, like, drove from 
We flew from San Diego to Detroit to LaGuardia uh, to Portland, Maine, and then drove three hours. And as soon as we got there, he says, Chris, put on some shoes. We're going to go dig out a ditch. And I was like, what? I have been traveling all night and not slept. And he's like, the youth pastor's septic tank is out. I'm like, okay. So we put on some shoes, and we go out there, and we start digging. And as we're digging and getting eaten by these flies, everyone's making fun of me because I'm from California, but I'd been digging for a living before that, and so I actually found the pipe. That's a side note. That'd be like when John said the, the disciple Jesus loved ran faster than Peter. You know, okay? This is called a little bit of arrogance and pride, I guess. But as we're sitting there and, and we're going, he's like telling the parable where he's like, I can't dig. I'm too old to dig. And he's like doing these biblical like stories while we're doing it. I'm like, this guy's teaching the Bible while we're digging over here. And he was working along these side, these guys that were part of the drug and alcohol ranch. Everything was a teachable moment. I was, I loved it. It's incredible. It's like, that's how we do it. We bring everything, but you can't do this unless Jesus is your everything. You won't bring him into everything. If he's a small part of your life, then he's going to stay a small part of the things you talk about. Right? And so you can't expect anything more than what you give to the next generation. And usually it gets a little worse with each one, right? But if, you, if you're all out, they could even go even further beyond where you're at. It's like it, it can magnify and multiply moving forward. But especially if you don't talk about it and don't bring it up, it shows it's not really that important. I think one part of the reasons we don't do this is not because we're just necessarily lazy. That's part of it. But because we feel like we failed. And that's the wrong perspective. When you think you failed, you just go look at it and say, no, that's not failure. This is God's, I need God's grace. What made me think I wouldn't? And so will you, my son. So will you, my daughter. Listen, I'm going to try my best to encourage you not to have these, these mistakes that are going to derail your life. But you know what? You might do it anyway. And I want you to know this is where we find grace. This is where we find forgiveness. This is where we find hope. This is where we find restoration. What better way to do that than to, to, than to lead them there by you doing it yourself? Right? That's exactly what Jesus' disciples experienced. They saw Jesus do it, and then they did what he did. It, will, it won't be fun. It won't even be possible if we don't love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. It's just not possible. Verse 8, And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Isn't that interesting? On your hand and on your forehead. Isn't that interesting? You will be marked by him. These will be the marks you take. Right? You can think about like the mark of the beast, like choosing to follow him. This is choosing to follow God. So you'll bind them as a, as a sign on your hand and before your eyes and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. We leave landmarks throughout our house and throughout our life. The idea is, is, is be intentional. Be intentional. You know, I, I, I love that, that idea of thinking like creatively. Have fun. Have passion. You know? Share about the things you're passionate about, about God. Like, like, talk about all that he's done. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Um, it reminds, uh, reminds the children of Israel to keep themselves by remembering how good God is or was then and now. It says, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your eyes all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb. When the Lord said to me, gather the people to me, and, they will, and let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they will live on earth, that they may teach uh, teach their children. So what's, what's he saying? Right? Take heed to yourself. Diligently, again, repeatedly, keep yourself. That's the first thing. Lest you forget the things your eyes have seen. 
And, and what is he, he's basically saying? Teach these things to your children and your grandchildren. When, when God does something and moves in your house, in your life, make a big deal about it. Like, like bring it up all the time. Guys, God did a miracle right here. We've seen a lot of miracles. We've seen them personally. We've seen them in the church setting. You know, I, I, it, when my kids were younger, they would pray for stuff, and it seemed like it always happened. Like crazy. One night, we were just sitting there. This is when we lived in Orange County. And for some reason, uh, I think it was my daughter, just started praying that we would have a baby and that our friends would have a baby. And we're like, what? You know, what is this prayer? Of course, we, we did want another one, but we weren't like, you know, timing was kind of odd because we were about to move to Carlsbad. And so she started praying for a baby and um, for us and our friends. And our friends, you know, we, we were both like, hadn't really been, babies weren't coming, you know? And so we're like, okay, whatever. But th- she just brought it up and all of a sudden, they're both pregnant. These two are 16 days apart and they're like best friends, those two babies. And it's like, you guys know that when God, God seemed to hear that prayer, right? Or remember when you guys, when we were praying for a place to live in Carlsbad, when he opened up an opportunity that's just like beyond our belief? Do you guys know you're living in a, a absolute miracle right now? You guys remember when we thought that these doors of the church might close early on and God did it. He came through. Don't forget the things you've seen and experienced. You guys remember Joshua, right? Joshua would be the one that would take the next generation and he would bring them. Moses had to die off with the old generation, right, in the wilderness because of unbelief. Joshua would take them across the Jordan into the promised land. What does he do as soon as he gets to the other side of the Jordan? Memorial stones. He makes a giant pile of stones that every time somebody looks at it, he says, guys, this is where God brought us through the Jordan. This is where a miracle happened. We will remember this spot forever. That's what he's reminding him. Don't forget the things you've seen and the things you've experienced because we are so quick to forget. We're so quick to like neglect and, and, and be so calloused and ungrateful and unthankful. We forget everything that God's done. Think about the children of Israel. It's literally raining bread. And they're like, it'd be better if we were back in Egypt. At least there was free onions. You're like, onions are disgusting. Why do you want onions? I'm sorry, that's my own thing, okay? But they, they, they were so delusional, they called them free. They were in, they were in slavery. They, they were like remembering the past in a way it wasn't. God had delivered them and brought them. And there was water coming out of a rock. They'd gone through the Red Sea. Uh, the army behind them had closed and they'd, God had preserved them. How in the world could you forget that? You know what's interesting? The generation after Joshua said they did not follow God, even with the memorial stones. You, you never know, right? But the idea is we want to set our kids up in every way that we can and set the next generation up to point where God did something. Don't forget it. It's good for you, good for them, right? What have you seen? What has God done? If you're a believer, you, you have something to tell. I mean, I remember thinking, well, I don't know what I could say to them. What's your testimony? All right? If your testimony doesn't move you, then are you, are you really saved? I mean, right? No, that should move us. God reached in and he grabbed me from the depths, from my sin, from desperation, from loneliness and brokenness, and, and, he's, and he's restored me. Look around. Pass that on. Share that. Don't just give rules without relationship. Share the good things that God's done and then experience them more and more and then bring them along with you. What were the things that, because he said, uh, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord, your God in Horeb. Horeb is Sinai, right? And we know Sinai is where they got the law, right? It's also where God restored uh, his covenant with them after they decided to take all their earrings and melt them together and make a golden calf. 
Just so, so smart, right? Moses, we didn't know where you were, so we decided to make a cow out of gold. We didn't know who to worship, so we figured this, right? And what did the Lord say? He res- it, there's, it, the scene's actually epic, right? God's like, I am done with you. Moses, I'll use you, but get out of my way. I'm, gonna dis- I'm done with them all. Moses is like, no, you're not done with them all. I know you're not. He's like, think about your reputation. Nah, you're, not gonna, you're not done with them all. He's like, fine, go into the promised land, but I'm not going with you. Moses is like, I'm not going into the promised land unless you go with us. And God's finally like, okay, I'm going to renew my covenant with you. Exodus 34, 5 and 6. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, uh, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The Lord, your God, merciful. This is what I want you to remember. Your God was merciful to you when when you completely spit in my face. Gracious. So gracious. Long-suffering. Patient. How patient is God? I mean, if you look around at the world right now and what we're trying to pull off, if I had the trigger, I mean, it's done, you know, right? You guys are like, I think we're done here. Let's just move it along, you know? But how patient is God? He's long-suffering, right? Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all of us to have this opportunity. He wants to see his believers go and be light in the darkness, keeping, uh, uh, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Yeah, right? He's, he's, he's so forgiving. He's so merciful for thousands. And, and that most likely means generations. But he doesn't, he, there is, you're not going to be clear from sin except for through the blood of Jesus. And our actions have consequences too. Remember, God is just and God is no joke. He's not just your homeboy, you know. Fear the Lord. Recognize the holiness, the purity. Psalm 127 says this, when we think about kids, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman strays or stays awake in vain. It is in vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sheep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So or the children of one's youth. The children are a blessing, but you better build your house right. Right? God wants us to build our houses right. So we don't labor in vain. You know, you could build the best athlete. You could build the best, um, you know, musician. You could build the, the best, the most tech designer. They could be the next, you know, Steve Jobs or whatever, Elon Musk. Anyway. Um, and none of that matters, right? It's like we want to build our houses on the Lord. So what's most important? That's the first fruits. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You go, man, I thought I'd train him up. No, listen to this. Do you see what it says? When he's old, he'll not depart from it. You guys know sometimes it takes a while to come around. <laughs> how, how, how many in here it took a while to come around, right? I mean, I, I see those hands, okay? It took a while, right? But I think the idea of training up a child in the way they should go, training means you're doing it with them, going along with them. I remember seeing there was a show... Uh, I, was, I just saw it, like one episode of it. I don't remember where I was at. But it was where these trainers, these athletic trainers, not just like these, they were like, you know, fit. Like, come on, be fit like me. These, these athletic trainers would go on like a two-month, like, binge-eating thing. And they'd gain a ton of weight. 
Like they'd put on like all kinds of weight and they'd eat like they'd never eaten before. And then they would try to get the weight off with the contestants. And uh, it was amazing to see how much it affected the relationship between the trainer and the one getting trained, right? Because the one that was getting trained is like, man, you're putting your money where your mouth is. And the trainer is like, whoa, this is harder than I remember. Whoa, it's harder to run like this. I kind of forgot, you know, because I'd been in, you know, immaculate shape my whole life. I, oh, man, I'm out of, and you'd see the trainers, like they'd be the ones throwing up running too. And, 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 and so it was like, come with me, we'll do this together. I think it's a lot more effective than like, you know, just being like, hey, come on over here and be like, this is like, oh, I might never be like you. But if, if you can come and show me that, that we're a lot more close than I thought, and then you can show me a way out, and I can see you struggle, and I can go with you, and, and it, there's something about that that's so reassuring. But of course, the devil wants us to be segregated, separated, and, and, and not honest, to lie, to be fake, to be phony. To not walk in the light as he's in the light. And to, you know, let the blood of Jesus cleanse us. We want to hide. We want to conceal. Jesus wants us to be honest, real, open. And, that, and, and then show what God can really do. The real thing inside of us. Then we train up our children in that way. And there's something about that you, just, you cannot forget. It's like you can't unsee it. Think about that. That's like Peter... Jesus is like hanging out with the crowd. He's like, hey, guys, if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you can have nothing to do with me. And everybody's like, uh, I'm gone. I am not into this. They had no context. And context is important, right? Looking back, we're like, it's communion, right? Oh, it's, it's talking about Jesus dying on the cross. It's his body and it's his bo- We get that, you know? Context back then? If you guys don't eat, eat my body and drink my blood, you know, you have nothing to do with me. And they're like, we are out. And so Jesus, what does he do? He looks around and he's like, are you guys gone too? You guys going to go? He's talking to the disciples. Peter's like, I basically don't know what you're talking about, but I believe you're the son of God and you have the words of eternal life. And so I, there's nowhere I can go. Like, I don't know what you're doing, but I know you. And I'm just going to keep following you. And maybe you'll explain that to me someday. And I hope I don't af- actually have to eat your body. But that's, that's the experience. That's the real thing. That's what brings people in. We're not victims of society. We're not victims. I think that's really important to understand. We are not victims of the world. We are world changers. We have the real thing. Everything Satan has is a counterfeit. It's all fake, you know. It's like a it's it's not it's like a roll flex. It's a it's oaky sunglasses, you know. It's all fake. It's not it's not the real thing, right? So we get to bring the real thing. But the problem is is that if the church is not giving the real thing, it's like we're doing double damage. God wants us to bring the real thing to a dying world because they're looking for something, some sort of hope. My, my hope is you're encouraged and that you'd be blessed and that honestly that you'd, you'd be encouraged to even invest first in your own personal walk with God. I mean, that's all of us, right? We all need to grow there, right? Like I, I mean, I thought being a pastor would mean you wake up and all of a sudden, like, a ray of sunshine would come in and be like, hello, my child, I have coffee waiting, and, you know, <sighs> oh, we have a breakfast nook. We don't have that. I don't have a breakfast nook. I have three kids. We live in an 850-square-foot place. There's a cat, and she wants to eat. It's all kind of chaotic. But it's, it's, it's like we, want, we need ourselves personally to draw closer and closer, having real experience with him, and then share that openly and honestly. Here's where I'm at. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's where, here's where I'm struggling. Here's where I, you know, whatever. Obviously, you don't say everything. But, like, let them in. Bring them in. And watch what happens. 
be encouraged, be blessed. Investing in the next generation is a holy and blessed calling. It's something we're, we, we have to do, we have to be involved in, right? I, I, one of the hardest things to do is to get people to serve in children and youth ministry. And you're like, you, is everyone complaining about the next generation? <laughs> What's this going to look like? By the way, they always complain about the next generation. Remember when the, it was about the hippies? These doggone hippies, and all of a sudden, now they're like pastors of every church, you know? God did like an amazing work. But you know what it took? Is it took real people being honest and, and transparent and used by God to reach down and get down on your knees and relate one-to-one. God does that. I think, I think, I honestly think there's revival coming. I, th- I really do. And I think this other stuff, it's like, it, there's nothing to it. This is the real thing. We have it, we experience it, then we bring others in with us. Follow me as I follow Christ. Disciples make disciples, right? Real leaders raise up more leaders. You're going to blow it, so will they. We need God's grace. We need to be empowered by his spirit to be able to do any of it. But God can use any of us because he's the one that's got the power. And it's all for him, for his glory. We were created for this. God wants us to partner with him and be used by him to bring his, his kingdom into this, this kingdom. To change the atmosphere. To not be thermometers, but thermostats. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your, your grace for all of us. We need your grace, Lord. Help us to not forget that. Help us not to think we're, we've arrived or we're something we're not, but that we'd be the real thing in everything we do. Even when the real thing isn't so pretty. <laughs> Even when it means being humble and honest and repenting and failing and all that. Lord, we just, we just want to be followers of you. And we see your disciples, they, they have great victories and they make big mistakes. But the key is they can keep on trusting and following you. And the more diligent and honest and real they are, and the more they um, set their hand to the plow, the more they're blessed and the more they get to see and the more they get to partner and experience your goodness, your working, your miraculous powers. God, help remind us tonight of all the things that you've already done. That we would be able to talk about them and share them and excitedly bring them to our children, bring them to the next generation. That we remind them of how active you are, that you're real, that you're with us, that you're moving here and now. We love you, God. We praise you. We need your power. We need your we need your strength. We need your grace. We need your, your spirit. Lord, we can't do it alone. We're never supposed to do it alone. So God, help us to give you our first fruits. Help us to give you our best so that we would leave a mark. We would make a difference. It's for your glory. It's by your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you.